Well, I'm very glad to be here today, uh, Thursday, February uh, 16. Uh, thank you to all the uh, attendees who have joined already. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Alejandra Magana. Uh, she is the WC Furnas Professor in Enterprise Excellence of Computer and Information Technology and Professor of Engineering Education at Purdue University. Her research program investigates how computational tools and practices can better support model-based cognition in STEM. So that was the official introduction. Now, the unofficial introduction is that <laughs> In 2021, PICAP organized the assessment workshop. Uh, I believe that happened in the month of April, uh, organized by Tim Atherton. And Alejandra was an uninvited speaker. And as soon as I listened to her talk, I was taking notes about everything. Everything that she was saying was super useful for my teaching. I teach computational physics, as I guess many of you do as well. So then um, I decided whenever I have a chance to bring Alejandra and share with us everything that she has done, we have to do it. So that's uh, the main reason why I invited her. Uh, so with that, Alejandra, I let you uh, talk to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. As I was saying, uh, as soon as I joined, I, I really enjoy the, the physics community. You guys always invite me and I do appreciate uh, in, any opportunity I have to get engaged with, with you. So um, good evening. Thank you again for the introduction. And the topic of my presentation today will be about some of the pedagogical supports we have identified uh, as useful for students so they can integrate computation practices sooner, um, often, and uh, more effectively throughout their undergraduate programs. So um, let me see, click here. Yes. So. Uh, my presentation will, after a very short overview of my research program, I will focus on two main topics. First of all, I'm going to share with you some of the work that we performed a few years back, trying to identify and characterize the problem, because there was really not a lot of literature from the learning sciences perspective on how students uh, integrate or learn computational practices in the context of disciplinary knowledge. Uh, I know the physics community has done a lot, and so we do appreciate all your foundational work. Uh, we wanted to understand how this happens um, in engineering as well. And, and, and then once we learn more on how this happened, we were able to identify some of the difficulties students experience. And we have been testing um, some pedagogical supports uh, that we, we think have been useful for the students. Um, and then at the end, we will, um, I really have a summary of findings, but I'm hoping we can, you know, just discuss future directions and what are uh, questions that need to still be answered and, and maybe, you know, explore opportunities for collaborative work. Um, one of the things I want to mention is that I tailor this presentation to be more for practitioners, so I may go very quickly over the research methods, but I do want to mention that, uh, you know, the theoretical foundations that we are using to inform our work. So to start with a brief overview of my research program, we really have mainly focused on, uh, on how computing can support uh, disciplinary practices in STEM. So I, I, I come from a computing background. I have uh, done my work mainly in engineering, but I'm also now working with biologists and I have done work in physics. So it's really highly interdisciplinary. So you can see here the collection of computational practices we have explored. And most of the work uh, that I will be sharing with you today uh, is centering mainly in modeling and simulation, but I'm gonna translate a little bit into computational problem solving. 
But I think that the findings and the, the supports that I'm going to present today also apply to other practices, even data science, or now that we are transitioning to uh, artificial intelligence uh, practices. So really what has motivated my, my research agenda is how can we integrate computational practices at the undergraduate level? And I focus on two aspects. Uh, I focus on the teaching. And so when I talk about teaching, I, I mainly focus on what the professors do in the classroom. How do they design learning materials? What are the intended learning outcomes? And, uh, and how they orchestrate you know, laboratory work with lecture and things like that? And, and really, what are the learning objectives that guide them through the integration of, of computational practices? And then, of course, I also look at the learning. Uh, this is mainly focusing on students and how they engage with these practices when the professor is not there. So this, you know, my, I guess my, um, the practical considerations of this presentation will mainly focus really, uh, I hear that's why I'm looping in into the learning aspect. So when they do their projects, uh, when they do their homework, what are the kinds of supports that we, that we can provide? And so the way I approach my investigation is, is very classroom oriented. And uh, we, we follow design-based research. Um, and you can think of design-based research as an engineering approach to solving educational problems. If you see this cycle here, you know, if you remove the, this arrow here, probably it, it looks very, very close to uh, the engineering design process. And so that's what we do. Um, so we start by identifying a particular learning need. We look into theory, and then we engage in designing learning interventions, learning materials, and deploying them into a classroom setting. And then, of course, the second part of the, the cycle is to do the research and the investigation. So um, we can generate mul multiple artifacts. We can refine um, learning interventions. We can create computational artifacts, we can create practices on how to integrate them and combine them with laboratory work. We can create data as well as we engage in this process. And of course, at the end of the day, we want to provide theoretical contributions. So the, the, the positive aspect of this approach is that we can advance theory at the same time we help students learn. So there is a practical and a theoretical um, contribution. So, I guess one of the things that we were asking ourselves is um, how do students engage? Uh, how do they learn? How do they apply their knowledge? What are the benefits of integrating computation um, at the undergraduate level? So uh, Michael Falk, who is also a physicist, uh, approached me many, many years back uh, because they wanted to do a curricular innovation at Johns Hopkins University. It was a great space to do this because it's a it's a smaller institution where we could really innovate and, and manage all aspects of the curricular innovation. So what they wanted to do is the, they wanted to introduce computational practices across the core courses of the undergraduate uh, undergraduate degree in the material science and engineering program. And the way they did this was first to create a, a specific programming course for engineers, um, which we are being gonna be called CPMSE. And I think it star, stands for Computational Material Science and Engineering. So it's, again, this is this was replacing the traditional programming course that often computer science department teach uh, for all engineers. Uh, so the idea was to make it very disciplinary oriented. And then within each of the six core courses of the discipline, the instructors would integrate computational modules, two or three per each course. So what we wanted to see was first whether students were improving their disciplinary knowledge as they engage in these computational uh, modules. So were they learning better the science uh, and, and I guess the engineering as well? So uh, what we did was to track their prior programming preparation. So some students 
took this special course that we created. Again, the idea was to solve engineering problems using programming, um, uh, learning programming as the students were solving engineering problems and material science problems. And we also, not every student took that course. So we were trying to see, you know, follow really the students um, as they were progressing in their undergraduate uh, curriculum. So the, the programming course was in MATLAB, but then the, the modules that were integrated in the, in the other courses follow either a, a configuring approach and a programming approach. So students took that CPMSC course, then they transitioned in their curriculum to these other courses, and they were either using domain-specific computational tools like console, or they were programming uh, mo uh, models in MATLAB. So, um, you know, it, it was a very easy way to categorize. So they either had to configure the model using a graphical user interface, or they had to engage in, in some, some form of programming. So um, here, here is our uh, first set of findings. You can see here in this graph, we have students who had no prior programming. We have here the students who came into these courses with one programming course, two programming courses, three to five, and then the CPMSE course. Now remember this, this, um, this graph is reporting on the collection of multiple courses, not the program, not the CPMSE course, but mainly the other, the thermodynamics, the kinetics courses and things like that. So we could see that when students were using um, disciplinary specific tools like COMSOL, um, we can see that most of the students benefited on their learning. I mean, you can see here that the learning gains were statistically significant between the pre-test and the post-test. So just to give a more context of these students um, took the lecture and after lecture, we did a pretest, and then they engage in the computational module. And then at the end of the computational module, they do the post-test. So this is the knowledge gain only by the lecture. And this is the combined knowledge between the lecture and the, and the computational module. However, when students uh, engage in assignments that had a programming component, uh, we still were tracking their, the number of courses, programming courses they took um, and, and tracking their learning gains. And, and you know, it was not as conclusive. Um, we needed to investigate more. Something was happening when they had to program the model that they were not benefiting on their disciplinary knowledge. Now, what was particularly interesting for us was the students who took the computational course. They actually, uh, you know, started, uh, you know, comparably, but then they did have, uh, they do benefit um, on their learning gains. We also tracked for their uh, self-efficacy beliefs. So basically how they felt they could apply these skills to solve problems and uh, in the context of academic assignments, but also outside of academic assignments, and, and how they thought it was important to learn computational skills. Again, we were tracking um, their number of courses they took, um, and then this, again, programming courses. Now, this, when, by the time we took this uh, survey, it, it was interesting that these students already had to had taken the course the previous semester. And so their self-efficacy belief remained high. However, these were the new incoming cohort and we surveyed them at the beginning of the semester and they had really were in the strongly disagree or disagree range on average. But then after the end of the semester, when we took the post test, their self-efficacy beliefs increased. So that was also a positive outcome. So the findings were inconclusive. We needed to understand better the problem and what was going on. So we then decided to do a, quali uh, a qualitative study. Basically, we took a handful of students. We took 12 students 
who took courses in the following a configuring approach. And then we took 12 students who took courses following the programming approach. And we recorded them as they solve a related computational problem, um, transfer problem. So it was not exactly the same assignment they had to do for the class, but a related problem where they had to, basically it was similar, but maybe applied to a, a different context. So we, we analyze hours and hours of students talking about how they approach this, the problem. But I want to summarize here the findings. So we were, first we characterize what the students were doing, either when they were defining the model, they were developing the model, they were engaging in the simulation experiment, basically executing the model, and then doing the analysis. And they did, they did follow a similar pattern when they were in the programming approach or the configuring approach. Of course, there were differences. For example, in the configuring approach, students had to develop some schematics and diagram. And of course, in the programming approach, they had to deal with the equations and the mathematical representations and transfer or map those equations into some sort of algorithmic representation. So I usually ask my audience, where do you think the students struggle the most, right? And you know, maybe uh, most of us would agree that with the model development is one of the hardest um, processes that, that the students have to perform. Now, I, I'm also highlighting here the configuring approach because domain specific computation and software has a lot of complexities. There are many, the graphical user interface is not intuitive. Sometimes there are multiple tabs and, and you know you really have to become an expert in the tool before you can uh, really become an expert in the in the how to use it for, for solving problems. So the learning curve for using domain specific computational software is, is high, right? So it has to be supported somehow. Now, going back to the programming approach, um, this step of mapping the equations to the algorithms was one of the most challenging ones. So to frame the problem, looking at learning gains, uh, we, we basically identified that the configuring approach was um, helping students learn the concept. The programming approach, we, we saw differences. It was very inconclusive. And we basically identified that the students' difficulties focused on the mapping from the conceptual to the mathematical representations and the mapping from the mathematical to the algorithmic representation. Now, there's a lot of research on how to use, I guess, uh, I'm going to say simulations. Um, you know, actually, FED simulations help a lot. Uh, I, I don't want to generalize into FET simulations being a configuring approach, but there is a, this graphical user interface and, and we do have substantial work looking at the use of uh, simulation for learning. But there was not, or, you know, the, the knowledge construction in this space is not as common. So we decided to focus on how students engage in programming, um, to solve disciplinary problems. So um, we wanted to understand um, how they can apply their knowledge and develop uh, expertise. And we started to look at the literature and we started to identify which th theory could guide our work. And we ended up focusing on adaptive expertise. Now, I want to mention that expertise um, cognitive scientists talk about expertise in two different ways. First, they talk about an absolute approach to expertise. And probably I'm talking, this approach is all of you, right? You are experts in your discipline. You have many years, uh, many hours of doing this type of work. And so you're maybe asking yourselves, well, how are we expecting undergraduate students to become experts? And that's where we focus on the relative approach to expertise. Um, the idea of this relative approach to expertise is that 
students come in into a class with some knowledge or as novices, but we have some learning objectives that we want them to accomplish at the end of the semester. And, and you know, in, in this relative approach to expertise, we can make the case that they have developed their expertise when they accomplish the specific learning objectives of a, of a course. So um, adaptive expertise is uh, a category, I would say, of, of the relative approach to expertise. So adaptive expertise, um, this work comes uh, from, I guess, literature from Hatano and Iñaki. Uh, this is more in the context of child, child development, um, but it has been adopted in the space of engineering. And, and even, uh, you know, Jose Mestre, I think, is a physicist. Uh, so the idea of adaptive expertise is that students, there are two dimensions to develop expertise. On the X um, axis, we have efficiency. And then on the Y axis, we have innovation. And we can think of efficiency as um, you know, how, how can we apply the knowledge in a, in a routine way? And then innovation basically focuses on how flexible we are of moving from all those forms of um, problem solving. So um, the framework actually proposes that the students could be in, in sort of like any of these categories as they develop on their knowledge. Uh, we have here the novices, and probably this is at the beginning of the semester. And then, you know, just continuing with the analogy, they can become routine experts because they they might learn, but I, I see this as the students who are very good at uh, applying the equation and having a result, you know, the plug and chuck type of approach. And, you know, so it is possible to pass the exam <laughs> just applying the equation, but not really... Um, not really understanding. And that word understanding is really the key for becoming an adaptive expert. The other dimension in innovation, you know, actually the framework they talk about the frustrated novice, I like to rather call it the innovative amateur. Because these are the students who try one thing, it doesn't work and very quickly move into multiple approaches and, uh, and then they might or might not uh, be successful. And of course, then there's the adaptive expert. And here's what we are aiming from, uh, I mean for. So here, the idea is that the students are efficient, but also they are flexible enough uh, so then they can apply multiple approaches. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, that there is this path of um, the ideal path However, it might happen that some students will come, will become routine experts, and then they may become adaptive experts, or they will start as innovative amateurs, and then they still can become adaptive experts. So, so but there is this idea that we want to see this optimal adaptivity corridor where innovation and efficiency are somewhat balanced. So with this framework in mind, uh, we wanted to see if students were developing this type of expertise. Um, so we went and did a, a, a second qualitative study. And this was, again, in the context of a classroom. Uh, students in this class had to complete five modeling and simulation projects. We focused on the fourth one because it was closer towards the end of the semester. And we, we recruited the students. We have uh, four and five students from one course offering and uh, six students from another one. And again, we did interviews. We use Think Aloud and we use qualitative methods to analyze the data. So I'm gonna go quickly through the analytical approach just so you believe me that we were thorough. <laughs> I know this, this, this may be a lot to, to process, because we did the analysis in, in, in five phases, right? But let me just highlight a few things. We wanted to understand the types of knowledge that the students use. And sometimes that was declarative, procedural, schematic, or strategic. So we were looking at knowledge application and characterizing the type of knowledge. 
but also uh, you can think of this as efficiency, right? Because how they apply their knowledge. But we also wanted to characterize their metacognitive knowledge. And we identified four categories. Some students were more fi fixated or they were more flexible, mechanistic and justified. Actually, if you look at the, uh, at the paper, it has descriptions for all of these. So we, we were very in-depth uh, looking very, very closely into the data. We wanted to understand in detail, but then if you have done qualitative work, it's very different, difficult to, to tell a qualitative story. <laughs> and, and so we had to step back uh, so that this is the zoom out. And, and once we understand in detail, we, we tried to do some sort of categorization. We did some grouping, it was not working. So we, we actually decided to um, came back and, and define how they are using their cognitive knowledge and their metacognitive knowledge. And then how that related to adaptive expertise. So let me unpack this a little bit more. So we were looking at how students were uh, applying, again, the, the type of knowledge and how they apply that knowledge. And we identified two major categories. There were some students who were very implementation oriented. These students were focused on figuring out how their code works. Uh, they were basically running the code, error, trying one thing, error. So they were struggling to make meaningful interpretations of the solution. Uh, and uh, maybe they might stop there or, or be successful, but that was their primary concern. Then we had the knowledge-oriented students. They really used their prior knowledge. They were connecting the implementation of their project using their knowledge and, and you know really really trying to inform their decisions focusing on the science and, and they did use the mathematical model. So those were the two major ways in which we identify students were using their knowledge. Now metacognitive approaches were two um, dimensions. Some students were more action oriented while others were very plan oriented. So the students who were action oriented, they just immediately started coding. Uh, again, this trial and error approach. While the plan oriented students, they really took the time to think through, okay, what is what I mean? Let me try to do some uh, plan for my implementation. They tended to debug their code more often. So once we identified these categories, we started to group or place students into these uh, quadrants. So, um, so this is what we found. We had um, an anchor basically focused on the, the, the quadrants that had more number of students. So we, we had only one student who was plan oriented and implementation oriented at the same time and two who were knowledge oriented and action oriented at the same time. But these, these were interesting points. And, and we, we went back into our framework of adaptive expertise. And again, this um, action oriented, uh, action implementation oriented is this group, which is here. Uh, knowledge and plan oriented is um, this group here. So we look again at the data and uh, we identified that these kids were really focused on completing the assignment. That was their major goal. <laughs> and thank you, Patricia. It's so nice to see the, the face <laughs> all the way. <laughs> thank you for the, uh, the report here. Um, this student, this, this is just one student, was focused on invention. You know, that, that student was uh, struggling, um, still some planning, but you know, only one observation, so we, we couldn't learn a lot. These students were focused on automaticity, were very good at programming actually, uh, but they may not have uh, been very, I guess, successful in connecting back to the science. Now this group was the, uh, another interesting group. And one of the characteristics of, of these three students was that they were really focusing on understanding. That is key. They were able to connect the science to the code. That is such an important aspect 
understanding uh, how you know the model is implemented and how that means in physical terms. Uh, and and the, these three particular students were really focused on that. So um, these these two, I guess, uh, corners. These students um, relied on very context specific procedural understanding, but then these students who were aiming to really understand, they combined multiple levels of understanding, implemented higher degrees of monitoring states, you know, a lot of debugging, a lot of planning, a lot of evaluation, and uh, were more self-generated in the way, you know, in, in setting goals and applying strategies. So coming back to our question, um, how does computational adaptive expertise looks like? Um, so one of the characteristics is how they use science to inform the engineering solution. Of course, the application of computational skills to implement that solution, but also as important is employing multiple strategies to test the solution and overcome challenges. So if we come back to this idea of adaptive expertise, um, there is this notion that it can be developed. So, uh, and then this is the idea, you know, right? We can move or we can help students transition from novice to adaptive expertise. Um, so if, we, if this can be developed, what supports can be used? So we can help students map or move from a conceptual to a mathematical representation. Remember that was a big issue. And then from a, an algorithmic to uh, mathematical to an algorithmic representation, and even from an algorithmic to a computational representation. So um, we look at the literature on scaffolding, and this is the scaffolding. I'm, I'm going to unpack this for you in the you know we in the next. A uh, few minutes. Let me see how I'm doing with time. Okay, yes, I I will move move through this very quickly. <laughs> but this literature on scaffolding, basically, what types of supports can we provide to students? And we got inspiration from Quintana and colleagues, and we have adapted these scaffolding approaches to in, um, supporting modeling and simulation practice. So let's look quickly at sense making scaffolding. This refers to ways to understand, to support students so they understand the real world phenomena and help them transform into representations. So this definition actually is aiming to that idea of representing, connecting back to the science, but also connecting that science into multiple representations. So we look at the literature and um, and really what we found is workout examples are a great way to promote sense making for students. It helped them, um, it actually has been used in science. There is a lot of work uh, even from Miki Chi and also in programming. And the literature says it, it also helps them manage cognitive load. So, um, this is in the context of Jupyter Notebooks or Google Colab. If you are familiar with this technology, it's very easy to uh, provide students with workout examples. So um, we, you know, here is, is a way that the, the instructor is providing an example and, and um, students, you know, they, they see the before and after. Um, so anyways, you can provide uh, workout examples using Jupyter Notebooks. We implemented workout examples in two courses, and uh, I'm just gonna jump quickly into the results. So we developed a nice collection of workout examples. We even developed videos, examples in PDF, examples, and these were the results. Basically, students did not use them. Even when the instructor offered extra credit, um, you know, students don't, they don't get the agency to go and find these extra resources for them. So we needed another way to keep them engaged. 
and also to help them connect the science. Again, this idea of connecting the science to the model was important for us. So we look at artic uh, articulation scaffolding and um, really explanations in science are a great way for students to make their thinking explicit and create argument. Um, so really uh, explanations are a very effective form of articulation. Uh, it can help students integrate novel information with previous knowledge and it can support transfer. So in programming, commenting the code is a very common practice. However, we repurpose commenting code so the students will self-explain the computation and models. So we actually, uh, what we identify is that students need to be guided so they would engage with the workout examples. And the way we, we did that was asking them to explain themselves the examples. So it was like a self-explanation strategy and I, they use in code comments to explain the examples. So we evaluated that in, um, strategy in a classroom and we actually identified different ways in which students commented their code. Um, you know, just in general terms, very experienced students wrote simple comments. Maybe they felt they didn't have to explain themselves as much. However, students with lower programming ability tended to write more comprehensive explanations. We also identify types of, uh, of explanations. And of course, we identify students who were not providing good explanations or unrelated explanations. Students who were like in between doing limited or mechanistic explanation. But really what we were aiming for were for explanations that were principle-based or more goal-oriented based. Basically explaining the rationale behind each line of code use conceptual knowledge while making connections to the problem. So you could think of uh, variable, this is variable X. Well, X, what does that mean physically, right? X means number of atoms in this, uh, you know, whatever. So um, explaining the code by making connections to the science was a very, very good way for students to, you know, in the in the recordings, we saw aha moments from students like, oh, now I get it, you know, so things like that. Okay, so um, workout examples can help uh, students connect the science with the computational solutions. And of course, um, doing these explanations helps students see better those connections, of course, the question, the open question is, can we teach students how to provide meaningful explanations? Because not everyone did a, a, a very good job at explaining the code. And actually we have started to integrate this argumentation framework of claim evidence reasoning, not only within the code, but asking students to explain the output of a simulation is not an easy task. And that is more of the work that we have been doing recently. Uh, and, and for that specific work, we are using argumentation framework. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly through the last two um, forms of scaffolding. Okay, I, I need two minutes and then we can engage in the discussion. Other types of scaffolding that we found um, useful were process management scaffolding. And here the idea is uh, many of my colleagues, engineers, usually ask students when they ask them to work on projects or homework assignments, the submission is the code in MATLAB. However, I've been asking them, we need to engage them in other stages of the modeling cycle. The experimentation, right? Now, now that you have the, mo the model, execute the model, um, solve the engineering problem or characterize a phenomenon and, and, and be more explicit into asking students to do some planning and of course, validation and verification, those are stages that are often overlooked in the classroom. So providing test cases is important so the students can, um, you know, validate their code uh, and so on. So um, anyways, providing, prompting students to implement the full modeling cycle is important. Here's just a, an example of 
uh, the planning the model, we are asking students to do a flowchart um, so they can think through the details of the problem. And then, you know, just asking them um, just to do some planning. Um, write down a tentative plan and just to prompt them to think about, okay, what are the thermodynamics concepts that you need to complete this project? Now, reflection scaffolding. Um, we really want students to develop their metacognitive skills and because that actually helps learners regulate their own learning. So uh, applying self-regulation during problem solving is really a way in which novices separate from experts. People who evaluate themselves and, and do multiple tests throughout the process, uh, you know, those are, are ways that will are more, um, I guess, desire for developing adaptive expertise. So really having students plan ahead of, you know, ahead of planning the model, do some planning of what is what you need, what is what you know, what what is what you don't know. Um, and also as they build the model, thinking about how to evaluate and, and you know, where do I find test cases or, or experimental data or another uh, nano-hop simulation tool where I can validate my own code and so on. And then really thinking about reflections uh, or on their learning and also how they work as a team. So here's just an example. Again, this is a project that the students submitted in their Jupyter notebooks. And we were asking students, you know, just what skills did you develop uh, as you accomplished this project? And, you know, they, they talk about all the skills they gained and, and which skill, what aspects of the project were more beneficial to their learning. All right, so to conclude, this is the scaffolding framework um, we are proposing to support the development of uh, or the integration of computation and skills, particularly in projects and homework assignments. Uh, I think that the sense making and articulation uh, um, scaffolding support cognitive approaches and process management and reflection help students develop their metacognitive approaches. Of course, the practical implications for learning, um, situating learning programming in the context of real world problems is important. This applies more for engineers. They go the other way. I know physicists, you actually integrate computation in the context of the discipline. So, But um, engage students in the entire modeling and simulation cycle, not only using models, for, but extending models, for example, right? Uh, planning, verifying, and so on. Um, integrating workout examples and engage students through self-explanation and in-code commenting. And of course, help them continually improve their learning through process management and reflection practices. Of course, the idea of scaffolding is that you gradually remove the supports. We haven't reached that point. So that is more like an open question. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation by acknowledging all the students who have um, work in all the studies that we have implemented. And of course, these are my coll collaborators from physics, materials, and biomedical engineering who have been very gracious in to listen to my advice and innovate in their own classrooms. Um, so thank you, everyone. And I am ready for your questions. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Alejandra. This was super inspiring. I took lots of notes. I uh, will see how my course, my next computational physics course goes based on your input. Uh, so I'll probably open up for questions from the audience. Maybe if you want to unmute and post the question. Hi, this is Marie. Um, if you were just to try one thing, one new thing in class, what do you think would be the most effective intervention out of all the scaffolding that you talked about? 
Well, that's a great question. Um, I always tell my colleagues, workout examples are very powerful, but you know, the idea is, are the students going to use them? So really workout examples and having students explain those examples, I think it's the low hanging fruit. Uh, because, um, and they can do that for extra points or in prepare, like a pre-lab assignment. Um, that would be uh, probably the best advice I, I could give. And, you know, even engineers, especially, they don't often start programming a model from zero. They always repurpose someone else's model, right? They, they take a... Um, uh, they download some code online and then they adapt it to to their purpose. The other suggestion actually is the use of templates. Uh, students, uh, you know, if you give them a programming assignment and just let them work with one particular function, probably the one that is taking care of the equation, that is also very helpful. Um, and and yeah, templates of code and also this idea of use, modify, create, or I will actually call it use, modify, extend. You give them a code of a very simple model. For example, the model of the a couple of atoms interacting, and then you ask students to expand it to 1,000 atoms, and then that's the activity that they have to do. So it's a working model, but it's a toy model, and then they have to uh, add more complexity to that model. So all those are very good strategies. Templates, toy models, workout examples. Kind of similar, but. So, so I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I was following um, the, the interventions that you mentioned, and then the question that came to my mind is, based on those interve interventions, how do we adjust a assessment? Mm -hmm. Because I guess the question is how much help we provide and, and how much we want to see what they learned. So wh what would be your suggestion in that case? Yes, and that is an excellent question. And um, I guess that was one of the purposes of the workshop, talking about assessment and computation. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you provide workout examples, you can go over those like, okay, you commented the, the code, great, right? You got the points. But usually, and especially now with technologies, again, like the computational notebooks, you can have multiple tasks, right? So maybe the first few tasks are very simple, but then maybe the one at the bottom is the one that has a little bit more openness and requires a little bit of more of creativity and transfer. So they may have to just take that model from the last example and repurpose it somehow. And then that is probably the task that will carry the, the weight of the, of the grading, right? So they, they have opportunities to get credit from the preparation, but also they have to, in a way, show um, that they have uh, acquired some knowledge. And of course, I am a big fan of rubrics. So my preferred mode of assessment would be, um, you know, a rubric that will measure. So we look at um, the code, how it, whether it's executing or not. And we look at how students commented their code in my rubric, so those are two criteria. And then we look at the uh, output and how well the output um, represents or solves the problem and the explanations of the output. Um, sometimes students have a hard time, as I mentioned, with that's what we just noticed recently, explaining the output of the simulation uh, or the computational model. So um, those, those are the four primary criteria we use for grading. Wow, that's very useful, thank you. Um, do we have other questions or comments? I, I had a, a question, well, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, we'll see. Um, but uh, 
one one of the things I was thinking about it, uh, as as you were presenting was um, there's sort of a balance in a lot of these computational physics classes that are are fairly common um, that uh, you want them to gain some programming skills, right? The actual programming skills are part of the the sort of important learning objectives of the class, but you also want to uh, you know, th those programming skills are not the only learning objectives of the class. You also want, of course, to then get into sort of the disciplinary bit. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of comment on how sort of these various things that these various interventions can support. Do you need to support both? Do you want to do one of some of them support one thing more than the other? So um, that is a great question. And I think that you simply cannot do all of them in the in the one semester, right? So one of the things that I advocate to, when I work with my colleagues is to have very explicit computational learning objectives in the same way we have disciplinary learning objectives, right? Like the students need to apply the uh, third law of thermodynamics and at the same time have an objective like students need to modify models or they need to evaluate models or they need to use models or they need to create models. And that's making explicit this computational skill that you want the students to develop. So start where sometimes faculty, the ones I, I interview, they start with, okay, what tool do we want to use? And I'm like, no, no, what skill, what computational skill you want to develop? Because if you just want them to use models, why do you, why are you torturing your students into programming in MATLAB or Python, right? But if really your goal is to provide um, that knowledge of creating a computational model, then you know you can start thinking about the tools and things like that. So yes, being explicit upfront, and then you know focusing on that skill, but I do agree there needs to be some connection because not all the courses should be about programming computational. <laughs> it's probably, it's very hard to, to do from, you know, for students, they, they need to build skills. We are actually in the process of developing an interdisciplinary course uh, between biologists and uh, biomedical engineers. Um, thank you. And uh, we are basically talking about that. Okay, they need to solve problems in biology, right? But uh, how are we going to integrate computational? There are many ways. We can integrate it. Let's have students validate a model or compare experimental data uh, you know, with, with the simulated data. And that's a, a, an objective in itself, right? Or they can modify an existing code. That's another type of... Uh, computational learning goal. So, yeah. Can I ask, I noticed that you said you analyze the data from six students or 12 students. How many students are taking one of these class? Yes, that's, so um, the qualitative work that we need, we did initially was with a private institution with small class sizes, but now the experiments are being done at Purdue. And Purdue, we have we are working uh, with courses at the 200 level and uh, the 400 level uh, with within a biomedical engineering course. And we have two sections right now, and each section has around 130 students. So these are large classes, and and some of the assignments are a combination of individual work and teamwork. So the first computational assignment was individually. And then the other two will be um, submitted as a team. And somebody's grading them, <laughs> all of this commenting with a rubric. <laughs> yes, so we actually work with the TAs and uh, we try to, if the, if the rubric has four, four criteria, it's easier because sometimes professors are task one, task two, task three, and the rubrics are way longer than the ones than the ones we use, right? Because they want to grade very detailed. But when you have that number of students, you know, maybe just look at the last task, pay, pay a closer attention to that, and then um, grade at a more higher level. Because they do take points 
minus one point if you forgot this, minus two points, that's a very hard way, in my opinion, to grade. Thank you. Yes. Well, I know these times of silent in a Zoom call are a little bit <laughs> uh, strange, but does anybody have any other comment or question for Alejandra? Well, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, within the, the context of the programming, did you notice whether, or did you look at whether or not students had trouble using meaningful variable names or did they use basically just random variable names. That's something that I've encountered in my work. I I don't I don't know. I haven't looked at that closely. What we want is even if they use sometimes the professor actually tells them what is the name of the variable that they have to use. Um, now in the comment they do have to make the connection of what the variable means and that's what we have looked for. Now the, the exploratory and the explanatory studies, those were with a first year uh, undergraduate course. So these kids really were learning the physics, were learning the programming and were learning the math at the same time. So, um, but they did seem to have gained a lot. Of course, they, they mentioned it was a very difficult course and that's why we, we started to integrate more supports. Thank you. I probably would like to make a comment. I, I found the, the framework, the expertise um, from novice to, to expert uh, framework. I found it fascinating uh, because in my disciplinary research with undergraduates, uh, we do computer simulations, but most of my students, and I, I am housed in a physics department, but most of my students are not physics majors. Mm -hmm. So they usually come to my research group literally with zero programming experience. Uh, and I love the framework that you introduced because I can see each of my students. <laughs> I can assign a point <laughs> for each of my students in that uh, in that um, coordinate system. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's very insightful, and and it will help me. I feel it will help me train my students better. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, there was a comment in the chat about the length of the comments. And yes, that was surprising for us too, that the more experienced students tended to write shorter comments. And, and we, we, I guess we explained that to ourselves. Well, they felt they didn't have to explain themselves much. Something that we did later was to ask students to write explanations so that they would teach a peer without, you know, so, so not to explain for themselves, but to explain a peer who was more novice on their understanding. So um, that was a different type of exercise. Sometimes when you ask students to comment the code, students are thinking that um, the audience is the professor. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they make a lot of assumptions. Oh, well, the professor knows what I mean, right? But uh, you have to be very explicit, comment the code for who, right? For, for, for yourself or for a more novice peer or for the professor, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah. I, can, I can add in my very uh, non-rigorous uh, anecdotal, you know, observations of this, that um, some of that may be that better programmers uh, are better at explaining what they're doing. And so I, cause I feel like a lot of my um, more novice programmers that I, I get in my class, uh, they write a whole bunch because they don't really know what to say. And so they just sort of type away. And I, I've kind of emphasized that you should comment and explain things. And I, they, I get sort of these long, but maybe meandering comments 
Whereas when some students really understand it, all they have to say is, you know, this is the, you know, final position or something. Right. Um, and so, so, so some of it may just be quality versus quantity where they, if the student knows they don't really have much quality, they, they just sort of keep writing. <laughs> I, I could see that. Uh, you know, it was just a big picture observation, but what we were really looking for was the connection. Okay, I see in my uh, local clock that we are two minutes past the hour. Um, I, I feel that we are getting to the end of this conversation today, but I see future pathways in keeping this conversation going on with Alejandra. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other comment. Um, and if not, I think this is it for today. <laughs> Thank you, Alejandra. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>